production's keeping up all right, but it isn't getting any better. It won't either, at the rate the men are going sick at the moment. Of course it won't, and that's the point of this meeting. Oh, good, here comes Nurse. Now, I've asked you all here to tell you what the management have decided to do about the factory doctor. They have discussed your joint production recommendation very thoroughly and agreed to go ahead. We have a doctor starting on Monday. Good news for you, nurse. He's had considerable experience as a works doctor and his name is Alec Burns. Oh, I know Dr. Burns. Good. Have you got that sick report, nurse? Yes, here, Mr. Sudbury. Ah, oh, thank you. Hmm. Now, this ties up with our overall absentee figures. Accidents are down, you'll be glad to hear, Rogers. Mm. And I wish I could say the same about dermatitis. Oh, I know that a certain amount of it is due to the work the men do. But how much of it isn't? Well, no, Mr. Sadbury. All right, all right, we'll leave that to the doctor. And I'll be very interested to know what he can do about it. The first hint of what was in store for me came when I was trying to find the turning to the factory. I stopped to ask the way, and it turned out that the man was going to the surgery himself. At first glance, he looked like a case of dermatitis. Fred Smart was his name. He'd been at the works for three years, and everything had been all right until they shifted him to the machine shop a few months ago. The trouble with his skin had seemed to date from this. He'd been off work for the past ten weeks having treatment, but the thing wasn't getting any better, it was getting worse. I felt sorry for Fred. This kind of skin trouble is stubborn of curing and may indeed become chronic. For a thoroughly miserable and demoralizing complaint, dermatitis takes some beating. But the thing about the whole business which I found most disturbing was that there were a number of people in precisely the same boat. After surgery, I did a bit of investigation with Nurse. Yes, well, without exception, the skin cases are coming from certain departments in the factory. The machine shop, the plating shop, and the paint shop. Definitely something wrong here. First, I'll have a quick look round the factory. Mr. Sudbury was one of the old school of works managers. He was prepared to accept new ideas up to a point. But his main concern was with his production figures. I had to convince him what a problem dermatitis can be. I told him, look, it can be prevented if you will help. First, we'll have to make sure that we've cut down all the risks in the factory and we'll need a great deal of help from the men. In the end, he became interested and agreed to come along to the surgery one morning and see for himself. Well, he came next day after morning dressings. I kept back a few cases for him to see. I showed him the arm of a lad who had just come in and told him how industrial dermatitis was caused through damage to the skin by irritating substances such as dusts, fumes and liquids. This lad's skin was red and he complained of irritation. After this first stage, you get weeping and scaling. Dermatitis is not infectious. It is quite impossible to pass it on to anyone else, though it can become a breeding ground for germs. And unfortunately, it can break out on other parts of the body. I showed him a case of oil acne as well. Oil had blocked up the pores and produced blackheads and pimples. Mr. Sudbury was no fool. He believed the evidence of his own eyes, and he called up the safety engineer to ask him to come round immediately. He told Bill Rogers to go round the works with me and try to get rid of the risks or take preventive action. First, we went to the machine shop. Here, I found several lathes splashing the cutting fluids about rather badly. Bill suggested a shield to protect the operator's legs and thighs. He lost no time and had the lathes fitted with the temporary shields until the permanent ones were ready. Cutting down the flow of the liquid helps to reduce the throw-off. But still some protection is needed for the hands. 
A barrier cream might be useful here. The men already knew that putting on the cream before work helps to bring off the dirt more easily when they're washing. Some of them asked me how it would protect their hands. Well, I said, it acts like an invisible glove and does in fact make some sort of barrier between your skin and the irritating substances you touch. But your hands must be clean before you put it on. There is a right cream for different jobs and I'll see that you get it. In the paint shop, I found they were using a synthetic paint, which I knew might be a likely skin hazard, unless it is handled with respect. One of the girls was wiping the surplus paint off with her finger onto her hand. Another was putting on a synthetic varnish with a piece of rag, which meant that her hand got smeared as well. A brush was the remedy here. I had a talk with these girls and told them they must keep their hands free from paint. I asked the foreman to keep an eye on them and to make sure they went on doing these jobs the safe way, even if it was a little slower. In one of the spraying booths, I watched a man with a paint gun. It was synthetic paint again, and he sprayed without bothering to put on his gloves. One of the most important jobs, this, to explain the risk and get the men to take action themselves. In the cremating shop, we had a different problem. Here, the operators wore gloves all right and some protective clothing. But the fumes rising up into their faces can cause a rash and sores inside the nose. This was another job for Bill. The installation of a cowl over the tank with exhaust ventilation to draw off the gases. He had something installed quickly and the fumes were kept under better control. In the plating shop, the splash danger was pretty bad. This was because the tanks were set too close together. I made sure that the men had enough protective clothing. More important still, I went over plans for the new shop with Bill. Here, the layout will cut down skin contact. He told me that the shop would be ready in a fortnight. Finally, my campaign included a talk to all the workers on the most important point of all, cleanliness. That started it. One man claimed that the water in his plant had been turned off for six weeks. Some shops had no towels and not enough soap. I got them their towels. The management arranged a regular supply of soap and saw to it that the water was turned on again. And on top of this, I organized weekly inspections. It wasn't long before the men were helping all along the line. And my dermatitis figures dropped down by about 50%. So far, so good. But as a matter of fact, I knew that I had only tackled one half of the problem. Probably the easier half at that. It was the other, the medical side, that was worrying me now. That was partly my affair and partly the affair of the men's own doctors. The numbers falling sick with dermatitis had been checked, but there remained the job of curing those who had got it. This is simple enough in theory, but again, the patient needs to be ready to help. And it isn't easy to get cooperation from a man who is depressed and bored. He must have something to do, for that is part of the cure. At home, his conscience nags him. He sees himself bone idle while his wife has to work just as hard with less money coming in. It isn't long before he is lending a hand with the household chores, and that is the worst thing he can do. A large part of the cure depends on his avoiding anything that will keep up the irritation. Soap and water, for instance. Soda. His skin gets worse. On top of this, he tends to avoid his friends, for his skin is a nasty sight. He feels he will never get better. He throws his doctor's advice to the wind and does more and more in the way of odd jobs about the place. Yep, yeah, when you got it, you got it for keeps, chum. Yeah, Fred's right. I've been off 13 weeks. It's worse now when it started. Well, what about me? 15 blooming weeks. I tell you straight, you can do all the doc tells you. Don't make the slightest ruddy odds. Nah. Woods? They stopped as soon as I put my nose round the door. But I knew who the culprits were. Fred Smart and his pal Joe Daly. The two who had been on the sick list the longest. Well, I couldn't really blame them for letting off steam like that. 
But the trouble was, they were spreading alarm and despondency among the men who went in anything like such bad shape. If that spirit had a chance to prevail, my task was going to be ten times as hard. But of course, that's it. Get two fellows like that talking for you instead of against you. Half your troubles would be over. But the only way to do that is to put them on their feet again. I've discussed the problem with their own doctors. They've given me a free hand. We need allies. I wonder now. I saw Joe's wife and had a talk with Fred's. By the time I was through, I knew I had two allies who understood what I wanted to do and were ready to help me do it. What you're scared of, boy. Just do what a doc says. You'll be as right as rain in no time. All right, Fred Smart. Good morning. Morning, Doctor. Now, let's have a look at this. Yes, I don't see why you shouldn't go back to your job on Monday. Oh, that's good. Same job. Why not? We'll keep a watch on you. Now that we have the new arrangements at the factory, it's very unlikely that you get dermatitis again. Good. Good morning, Mr. Sadbury. Morning. I must hand it to you, Doctor. I've never seen such a transformation in any place. Oh, it's all in a day's work. Besides, I couldn't have done it without your help. Oh, no, I'm afraid I did very little. By the way, we shall have to keep an eye on these chaps who've had dermatitis. If they show any signs of getting it again, we may have to think of switching them to other work. Mm. Well, we'll deal with that problem when we come to it, eh? Cheerio, Doctor. Goodbye. And then, when everything seemed plain sailing, I had the case I knew would turn up. It was young Alan Ross. He had been shifted a week or two earlier to the plating shop. And there he was, a classical example of industrial dermatitis in its earlier stages. I've carried out all the drill. I use your precious barrier cream and I keep myself clean and still I've got it. For the last few weeks, Doctor, I've listened to a lot of claptrap about preventive measures. If you want my frank opinion, I think they're a lot of hooey. I had to decide how best I could help him. You see, there are certain types who are more prone than others to the complaint. And there's always the odd man out. The chap like Alan, who'll get dermatitis despite all precautions and for no apparent reason. It's difficult to explain this, Yet I knew that I couldn't let him leave here with a grievance. As a matter of fact, you know, these preventions are not a lot of hooey. Here, look at these figures and see for yourself. We've cut down dermatitis cases by more than two-thirds. But how do you explain me? I can't. I'm just asking you to accept the fact that from time to time there are people who get dermatitis no matter how careful they are. And let's admit it. We don't know everything in medicine yet, but we're learning all the time. We hope it won't be long before we can explain. That doesn't weaken the case for preventive measures. But I don't see how... Do as I say and we'll have you fit in ten days' time with ordinary good luck. Then we'll see what we can do about getting you transferred to another department. The point is, there are exceptions to every rule, and you're one of them. 